We're going to continue with uh, this introductory, sort of short introductory chapter. And we sh we're supposed to finish it tomorrow and then have time to actually start the problem set according to the syllabus. Okay. Um, <coughs> so, you know, a transducer is something that transforms energy from one form to another. And this is just conversion. And there are certain uh, desirable properties. And um, sometimes you can't have all these. You just have to settle for what you can get. But um, we're going to be talking about them a lot, we, and we need to be able to describe them. So I have these single words that describe them. The first one, probably the most important, is linearity. We talked about that yesterday. So a linear transducer is one where the output is proportional to the input. So if you have a microphone, for example, you double, and it's detecting a sound wave. If you double the pressure amplitude of the sound wave, you double the voltage coming out of the microphone, right? Now, I have to tell you that this is, of course, only valid over some range of, of input values. If, uh, if you drive a microphone too hard, and we'll, uh, oh, I don't know if we're gonna discuss this, I'll try to remember, but typical microphones, uh, they're capacitive um, microphones or condenser microphones. There's an element in there. There's a membrane that vibrates. And um, it forms a capacitor with this fixed plate here. And if, um, if the sound is too hard, the membrane can actually hit the plate. <laughs> OK, that's non, it becomes nonlinear. So, um, <clears throat> and similarly, as we saw yesterday, an indication of yesterday. If the input is too small, you could be swamped by noise, right? So there's, there's going to be a range here. Flatness, I don't know if we talked about this briefly last quarter. This is another important property here. Sometimes, often you have, usually you have in a transducer over some range. What that means is if you, um, <coughs> if you, change the frequency without changing the amplitude. So let's go back to the microphone example here. Suppose you have this incoming wave, sound wave, and you change the frequency, but you don't change the pressure amplitude. It would be nice if the microphone gave you the same voltage, right? So we use the word flatness there. We say that the microphone is flat over the certain range of frequencies. It's the second one, uh, passivity. Uh, this is where you don't have to basically supply extra energy to your transducer. All the energy is coming from the input. All right, and this can be important, uh, especially if you're doing field work in transducers. You don't want to have to supply a lot of energy. And as we'll see, uh, many transducers, uh, particularly like mic the microphone that I was just talking about, that microphone can't act on its own. You need to charge the capacitor in there. I don't want to diagram this. So we have this, this membrane here that's um, charged. There's the button here, this fixed plate. For this thing to work, this has to be charged, OK? The sound wave, incidentally, the way it works is, and we'll talk a lot more about this, the sound wave coming in vibrates the membrane, and that changes the voltage across here. And you want to keep the charge fixed. You have to keep supplying that. It'll bleed off slowly due to humidity, mainly humidity and other effects. So you've got to have a, a, a voltage supply there. So it's technically, it's not passive. Uh, reversibility. We're going to have a lot more to say about this because it has to do with reciprocity. These uh, transducers that can convert energy in either direction, basically. So. We're going to go over this. I, don't know, I, I wasn't planning on getting into this microphone thing. We're going to talk about this in these diagrams. But um, in the microphone case, instead of detecting the sound and getting a voltage, suppose you drove the capacitor plate here. What's going to happen? You're going to send out sound, OK? All right, so that's reversibility. Um, <coughs> so the. First two prob pro properties are usually the most important, as you'll see. 
Uh, it, there's one interesting case that I think I briefly mentioned yesterday, a hot wire microphone. This is where you have a resistive element here, and you put a current through here, okay? And so this is going to heat up. A sound wave coming here will, um, will change the temperature a little bit here, all right? When the compression part of the sound wave, it's going to be the temperature of the resistor will be a little hotter. And the uh, resistance depends upon the temperature for a resistor. So you can actually use this if you're very careful. You have to be extremely careful when you make these. It has to be a very thin wire. Uh, alternatively, you can pay like $10,000 and buy one. Uh, we did that some years ago, and the transducer ended up being a piece of junk. We didn't. We tested it. It failed to. It failed some basic tests. So since where taxpayer money goes sometimes, just. You know. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's the idea here. You're using the for a hot wire microphone. It does not <coughs> satisfy any of these properties. It's quite complicated. What's going on here? And uh, they're actually, Bar Library has two books on this. It's called Anemometry. This is the basic subject of anemometry. Maybe you've heard of it, anemometry, anemometers. So um, uh, that's an interesting. It, does, it fails all of these properties. But we were so desperate for what we were doing is we, would, we, were, we were willing to give those up for, what we, for our application. And in the end, though, it just it, it, it failed. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, there are for electro, which is called electroacoustics, or maybe better, electromagnetic acoustics. When we say electro, we're also including magneto in there, as you'll see. There are five sort of different categories of conversion mechanisms for electroacoustics. Now, I'm going to use the word uh, mechanical here, but you can read this as acoustical. You know, acoustics is fluid mechanical, right? So uh, to understand these and this classification, we need a couple of words here. This goes way back in your education, a motor and a generator. Remember what a motor is? <laughs> a motor is something where it converts electrical energy to mechanical energy, right? It's, spin the thing up typically, that's a motor. A generator is the reverse. So here's where you have mechanical energy, like you're turning a crank or something like that, and you're generating electrical energy. So they're, so they're the reverse of each other. So the first category here, oh, and these, these names have specific meanings in transduction. Electrodynamic, you know, it's kind of a general word. People use it for, and we, have, we have a specific meaning for it here. Okay, and also, in case I forget the next one, electrostatic, we have a specific meaning for that, as you will see. So what do you mean by electrodynamic conversion? Well, this has to do with the fact <coughs> that if you have a current, a current carrying wire in a magnetic field, there's going to be a force. In general, there's a force on that current. It's given, if you look at a, a short element of this loop, whatever this you know, your current loop may be. If you look at a short element, dl of it, going in some direction, you take the current multiplied by dl, crossed with the magnetic field, and that gives you the force on that wire. Okay, it's, it's a magnetic force. That will give us motor action, because if I put current through there and it moves, I'm converting electrical energy into mechanical energy. Okay? We, and we'll go over this in, in more detail in a moment, but let me point out the reverse. A generator, what's the reverse of this? The reverse is um, <clears throat> if you have a conductor and you physically move it in a magnetic field, you can generate um, a voltage across the conductor. And that is even more elementary. These come from the same source. This comes from the magnetic force. Uh, this is the most basic equation 
for a ma the magnetic force. The force on a charged particle of, you know, a charge, dq, we're calling it dq dq because we're thinking of a current. This is an element, you know, of the charge and the current. It's the charge times the v cross b, qv cross b. Um, so, <coughs> um, <coughs> So, let me see, I'm lost here. So that this is generator action. If we uh, force this conductor in a magnetic field, we, get, we can get a force on the charged particle, the charged particles in there, the electrons. That can give us a current, or if it's an open circuit, it'll give us a voltage between the ends. So that's the generator action. So let's, this, is, this is pretty general. Let's look at a specific case here. This is probably the most, most important ones. This goes way back, 100, roughly 100 years. This is the uh, basic idea behind a loudspeaker, right? So it's, it's actually simple. I don't know how many people understand this, but just about everybody should. I mean, these are very important devices, right? You can't live without them. And it's actually pretty simple to understand. There is a... Um, <coughs> So we're, this is going to be the motor action here, okay? We're going to oscillate the current in this voice coil here. This is a coil. Here's an example of a voice coil. It's wire wrapped around some form. Very light because this whole thing is moving. And you want to, you want to get big amplitude, so you want to cut down on the mass. But you don't want to sacrifice strength. That's why it has these ribs here. So this voice coil here, we're going to send oscillatory current through there and drive a sound wave. Okay, and here's how it's done. The voice coil sits in a magnetic field. This isn't just any magnetic field here. It has an axis of symmetry. So it's kind of surprising when you first see it. The magnet actually looks like this. There's a north pole or south, doesn't matter here. And then the south pole's out here and it has rotational symmetry about this axis. So the magnetic field is radial. The magnetic field right here is pointing radially outward. Here it's pointing radially outward. And it's the same, you know, all the way around here. And why do they do that? Well, you can see why. When we have, let's imagine there's some current in the voice coil. So the dots here represent out. So the current's coming out here and going in there. Crosses represent in. So let's look, uh, let's say this side. The magnetic field points here. The current's here. Okay, what's the, what's the force on the wire? It's the current crossed with the, uh, let's see, it's IL, IDL, so the current is in, crossed with the magnetic field, which way is it? Down. Make sure you see that. It's this, cross that, so it's down. And by symmetry, but we can confirm it. If you come around here and come out here, now the current is here, the magnetic field is here. When I cross the current with the magnetic field, it's down. So there's a downward force, and it has to be by symmetry. There's a downward force all the way along the, the voice coil here, all around it. When the current oscillates in the other direction, the force goes the other way, so you can you drive sound. That's the basic idea. Now there's some there's details, of course, here. You want a strong magnetic field. Right? And so one of the ways to do that is you don't want the, mag the gap here to be very big. So this gap tends to be very small. And I'm going to pass around an example here. And you can actually see in this example um, a cutaway, a literal cutaway. That the, This is pretty small. If you, one way to damage a loudspeaker is the voice coil can start to rub on the gap. That's bad, right? Um, the standard way that people damage a loudspeaker is how? Do you, do you know how? I'm sure the membrane. Well, I'm, I guess I'm biased here. I'm thinking of me in the laboratory, me and my students in the laboratory doing nonlinear experiments. We drive the loudspeaker too hard. What, you know, what the public is, they probably bang into this, you know, I, right? Kids, your kids. <laughs> okay. Um, what happens if you, over, you drive it too hard? There's actually two things that can happen here. What if I put too much current in the voice coil here? This is pretty thin wire. You can burn it out. 
So then it's, uh, the resistance goes to infinity. So how do you know if you've burnt out a, uh, if, you're, if a loudspeaker is not working, first thing you do is make sure you're driving it, right? Uh, but what's one of the, what's the next thing you're going to do? You just get an ohm meter, look for the look for the resistance, and if it's infinite, you've burnt it out. Another thing you can do is, at lower frequencies, you can actually you know exceed have too big of displacement amplitudes here. You can actually tear some of the material here. Uh, oh, incidentally, I should mention. This is a small gap, like I said, so this, the voice call has to remain centered. You don't want it to rub. So that's the purpose of the spider here. And it's universally brown. I don't know why, but everybody makes this. <laughs> it's some, I don't know what it is. It may have something to do with the material. But this is the surround, and you'll see there's one, one inside here, and I'll pass this around in a moment. That's its purpose. Uh, we need to seal this. This frame here is not moving, but the cone is moving up and down, and we need to seal this. We want a mono, a monopole source of sound, right? We don't want this. We want, uh, you know, like a piston cylinder. We want a volume change. So we need to seal this off, and it needs to be supported anyway. So that's this foamy black stuff, typically, that you feel. It's called the surround. Uh, Okay, so, so I don't know who did this. It was done a long time ago. They did a great job. It says got damaged on the back here. So I don't know what happened here. Um, it, the uh, voice coil is rubbing. That could have been done when they cut it out. I don't know, and maybe they burnt out the coil. I don't know. But they didn't throw it away, which is good. It's actually good for two reasons. You can see what they did here. They did an actual physical cutaway. You've probably seen this in diagrams. Well, this is, you know, they went actually in here and cut this, and they did a great job. And you can see the, uh, you can see the voice coil. You actually see the, the copper wire, if you look in here. The voice coil wrapped around this light form. The electrical connections, the spider, the cone, the surround. So it's really nice. And it also has this nice, like, handle. You can carry it around, so it's perfect. <laughs> so let me pass this around. Um, this was burnt out at, in 2012. It's got a little tag on it here. This is a part of a, a big woofer, a 1,000 watt woofer. This is serious. Okay, it's very heavy, but very, very heavy magnet. And we burnt it out. And you know, it was like a. Let's see how much did that driver cost? It's expensive. And somehow I didn't know this, and I, I should have. But you don't, if you burn out a coil or you damage the cone, you don't have to throw away the loudspeaker. You can get it reconed. I never knew about this until some few years ago. So they reconed it. They replaced all the moving parts. They ba and, and this is what, this is the old, this is the burnt out, this has the burnt out coil. So they gave us this back and I said, I'm gonna keep this for a demo, right? You can never have too many demos. So um, I'll pass this around. You'll be impressed how light this is. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so is this reversible? Sound wave comes in. It's going to cause the cone to do this. Now we've got this voice coil. Oh, we've got wire moving in a magnetic field. Yeah. You can track that through. You can use this. There's going to be a force on the electrons in there, and it's going to cause it's going to cause a current if the voice coil is closed. If it's open, it's going to there'll be a voltage there. So we usually talk about voltage. There'll be a voltage, and we can demonstrate that. Here is somewhere here too many demos. Today. Here is a loudspeaker, Radio Shack. I don't think Radio Shack sells these anymore, but they used to sell a lot of loudspeakers pretty inexpensive. We bought a lot from it. I think they stopped doing this. Uh, so you all recognize this, right? Um, and what I'm going to do first is show you that it works. Okay, it's 200 hertz. So I don't know, you, keep, you can't see it, but you can, you can feel the cone moving. Okay, and we now know how that's what's going on there. Okay. Now, can this thing be, we've actually did this to work with 
demonstrations for kids where we let them scream into it and kids love to scream. Okay, this should be reversible. Now we're not, that's just in principle. We're not saying it's a very efficient microphone, right? That's a different issue. Very pra now we're not talking how practical it is. But in principle, this should be reversible because of this right here. So let's see if it is. So I'm, I'm not going to have you guys scream into this, you're adults. <laughs> uh, so what I'm going to do is, I'm going to drive this, oh boy, what am I, yeah, I'm going to drive this loudspeaker here. The 200 hertz. Okay. And I'm going to take this and connect it to the oscilloscope. Now I've preset the scope, I can't see it, but it's supposed to work. <laughs> Which, you know, often it won't with demos. It's some, something about demos, they fail when you need them the most. So let's see what happens here. Is it working? I've got it triggered on... Okay. Yeah, this is a microphone. Um, and uh, what mode... I did this years ago. And what motivated me was when I was... I saw this article in Physics Today decades ago when I was a graduate student. And it was talking about the first atomic blast, you know, at New Mexico, right, during the World War II. They wanted to detect the sound. Okay, and they didn't want the microphones to be destroyed. So they used very large, it looked like 18 inch loudspeakers as microphones. And, um, a few years ago, I wanted to get that. They had a photograph of this. Great photograph. And I searched for it, but I, I couldn't find it. Even, you know, everything's digital. You can do digital searches, of course. But it would be nice to have that. If anybody wants to search for it again, yeah, it's, it's somewhere in physics today in the 1980s. <laughs> okay. Uh, any questions? Uh, okay, so, oh, we spent a lot of time on that. Okay, what's next here? Electrostatic conversion. Okay, I don't know if it's such a great name, but it's, well, it's really static, but this is, what, this is the word that's used. And this is what we were talking about before. Uh, here's a typical case. We have a capacitor with one fixed plate, one moving plate. If you charge them up, this is like the microphone that I was talking about. You charge this up. Um, if you, so you've got this charge. On top of this, if you add an oscillatory voltage, okay, what's going to happen? Right now, think of it as being in equilibrium here with a spring and the electric attractive force. If I, on top of this constant, a DC voltage, if I put an oscillatory voltage, when the charge, when this is, you know, greater negative value and this is a greater positive value, there's going to be a greater electrical attraction. It'll move this way. When there's less, it's going to move the other way. So if I oscillate this, I do this, this can send out sound. Um, and the microphone is the, is the opposite that we talked about. When sound comes in, it moves this. It's going to change the voltage here. Now this may, you, you wanna, no, this is simple, but I wanna make sure you get it. We're gonna go over this, we're gonna actually do some calculations on this uh, next week, I think. We want this to keep this charged up. When sound comes here and it causes this plate to move, what's happening to the voltage between the plates? And why? The voltage is changing, why is the voltage changing? The charge is held consistent. And then the, the charge is sorry, what? The charge is held consistent, and the distance constant. Changes. Constant. And the distance changes. So then by the capacitance. Logical. Yeah, you can look at it two ways. The simple way. You're right. You can look at it that the voltage. Think of this as an ideal closely placed plates. Closely spaced plates. Oh, that's hard to say. Um, we have a constant field. The voltage is the electric field times the distance of separation. Very simple, elementary. We're going to get a lot of mileage out of this in this class. We're going to apply it even when it's more complicated and it's just a very rough approximation. That's what transducer people do because it's so simple. And if you go beyond that, it can get complicated if you include end effects here. So 
the electric field is constant because, as Daniel says, the charge is remaining constant. So we change the distance, we change the voltage. You can also look at it from this point of view. Um, the capacitance is inversely proportional to the distance. So we have a fixed charge. We're changing the capacitance. We have to change the voltage. We're going to make extensive use of this, too. Uh, OK. So one of the applications here that's not well known, but people have worked on it for decades. I mean, it goes way back. I don't know how far back. It, you know, it, it could be 100 years. It could be back with the beginning of the standard loudspeaker. And that's what's called an, an electrostatic loudspeaker. How many people have heard of an electrostatic loudspeaker? Yeah, not, not many people know about these. Uh, you're looking, you're seeing one right here. This is one. And one of the reasons you don't know about electrostatic loudspeakers is that thing costs $1,200. Okay, they're expensive. Why are they expensive? Well, and why do, and why do people have them? Well, let me ex explain this. First of all, here's, um, let's look at how they, let's look at how they work. It's a basic diagram here. I need to add the word membrane. This is a flexible membrane. And you can see you can actually see through the membrane here. See, you can see my face through the grill. These, these two fixed plates here are is this, this back and front perforated metal things here. And in between is this very thin membrane. And it's coated with metal. All right, it's got to be a conductor because we're going to char take charge on and off of it. And it's ex so thin that it's, uh, it's, tr it's uh, transparent or, yeah. Yeah, you can see through it. And here's how it works. And here's one of the reasons it costs a lot. We're going to oscillate. The, there's going to be an audio signal that's going to um, change. Right now, by symmetry, this is symmetrical. There's no force on the membrane. But when we put the acoustical signal in, we, we put an imbalance in charge here. We're going to drive this thing back and forth. And that's going to create sound. Now, to make this practical, you've got to have kilovolts here. So there's, this thing is really heavy. It's got a, uh, you know, you plug it into the wall, and then it goes, well, actually, you plug it, there's an adapter here. And it beefs up the voltage to a very high value. Uh, it's kilovolts. It has to be. And here's the audio signal coming in. That also has to, that's also beefed up. You see the step up transformer here? And that's uh, just that's one of the reasons why this thing is so heavy. You could, after class, you can just uh, check it. You know, all you gotta do is tilt it, and you'll see how heavy, it's very heavy. So here's the idea. We've got a constant, we gotta keep these charged up constant amount. The audio signal comes in. It's going to oscillate the charge here. Um, there's going to, at one time, you know, this is going to be more negative charge here than when there's no audio signal and less negative charge here, right? It's going to oscillate here. And the voltage here oscillates. When this has more negative charge, that's going to give us a, a force, an upward, an additional upward force. Before at equilibrium, there's a force here that's balanced by the force here. When this becomes more negative, it's going to tend, there's going to be an upward force. This will be less negative. So compared to equilibrium, that force down here will be less, right? So in effect, it's also pushing in the same direction. And this is a standard transducer trick that people use. It's, and they all call it the same thing. It's, it's a push-pull effect. We're getting basically a factor of two here in our, in our drive because there's a force here and there's an equal force in the same direction here. They're both acting in the same direction. One's pushing, one pulling, right? They're doing it, to, they're acting together. So this is the way that uh, transducer people buy themselves a factor of two. And I'll point this out at least one more time in the class where uh, it's a common thing. And a factor of two in transduction can, be, can make a big difference. It can. Uh, so let me, oh, why do people deal with this, all this trouble? Well, it's because this is such a light membrane, it can respond very quickly to, chain, to the audio signal. And um, it also can be made quite large. You can see how big it is here. There's a big radiating surface. So what happens is the highs, the high frequencies are very crisp. 
with a loudspeaker. And that's why, uh, electrostatic loudspeaker. And that's why people like them. It's, it's, it's better sounding. I'm, and I'll try to convince you of that in a moment. Uh, the downside is you, you get very little displacement here, so it's not good for low frequencies. So we looked into this for a long time before we bought this. I, I wanted to just get just an electrostatic loudspeaker. And you can't, it, we couldn't find them. <laughs> okay, and the reason is they just, you have to have a woofer to go along with them, and that's how they sell them. So down here you'll see a woofer. Okay, it's a, loud, a loudspeaker it's for the, to fill in the low frequencies. So let me play some music for you here. Uh, um, oh. One of the things you want to notice is the sound. I don't know if you're kind of a little bit far away. Um, but you can hear it's coming from all here, the high frequencies. And I think they, I think it sounds good to me. I don't know about you guys. <coughs> um, but that's the idea. That's uh, music from the original The Day the Air Stood Still by Bernard Herrmann, 1951. Classic movie. You heard of it? Somebody? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I've only seen it about 50 times. <coughs> Okay, um, there's an, a magnetic analogy to this, and it's, here it is, very similar to here, instead of the electrostatic case where we got the magnetostatic, we got, imagine these permanent magnets here. If I wrap a coil of wire on this magnet, and the current's going in the, depending on the direction, I can strengthen the magnetic field or decrease it, right? So if I oscillate that current, I'm going to drive this. So that's, and that can, we can rig that up to generate sound. What about the going the other way? Suppose I move this magnet right here. Do I get a voltage? So just imagine this is open. Just imagine this going to an oscilloscope like we did here. I guess I can turn this off. This is kind of, yeah. So imagine we hook this up to an oscilloscope, very little current, just looking at voltage. What happens when I move this here? Anybody? Okay, this is fundamental to electromagnetism. I'm changing the magnetic flux through this loop of current. I'm gonna get, that's Faraday induction. I'm gonna, there's gonna be a Faraday induced voltage. We will see that again and again in this course. So that's the generator action. Uh, now, for the next two, we're going to spend a lot more time on this. You're not going to be able to understand this right now. I'm just going to give you some basic facts about it. The next two. And they're analogous to each other. This electrostrictive and piezoelectric conversion. All right? So, so don't ask me questions about... No, no, no I don't want to say that. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk much more about this. But I just want to set the idea here. When you have a, some material between some capacitor plates, you're going to polarize it. Okay, there's, you'll induce or align, either way, it doesn't matter, these dipoles in here. All right? If I, if I change the charge on here, on the plates, what's going to happen? I'm going to change the polarization, right? I can strengthen the polarization. And in general, that's going to cause a strain of the material. The, the material will become thicker or thinner. It can actually go either way depending upon the material. And we'll talk a lot more about this. So that's electrostrictive and piezo, uh, piezoelectric effect. So if I oscillate the voltage here, I, I get this material that I, I can send out sound. Okay, so that's the motor action. What about the generator action? If I now come in here and s squeeze this and stretch it out like that, because I'm changing the polarization, I'm gonna change the, change the voltage. And we can't live without this. And, um, and I appreciate that a lot, a, a lot because I've been around for a while and when I was young, stoves had pilot lights. Do you guys know what a pilot light is? Just, oh, okay, so, oh, all right. 
So when, the st when you want to turn a stove on, you had to light it. And, it, and you know, they, they didn't want, and people don't want to strike a match. So they had this, they kept this flame, little flame, one or several flame, small flames going, just eating up gas 24-7. Right, and now those are all those are just about gone, right? And what are the, what's in its place? A piezoelectric starter, right? So here's a um, here's a demo of this. Oh, let's get let me get the lights. Oh, let me. Well, <laughs> wrong time of the day, huh? So there's a piezoelectric material here, and I'm going to exert a, a, a force on it. And I, the voltage can be so high that it can break, the electric field is so strong between these terminals here that it breaks down the air. You get a spark. You guys see the spark? Uh, yes. Now what happens if I go slowly? Oh, no spark. What's going on there? Well, I'm not sure. And if you, um, if you disagree with me, let me know, okay, now or later. But um, we're tending to generate a high voltage here. But all it takes is a little bit of humidity to, discha you know, to discharge, uh, to, to, to cause, to reduce that voltage. So I suspect that's what's happening. So you have to do this quickly. And that's the idea. Oh, can... Um, Somebody, excuse me, can somebody get the lights, please? Thank you. So here is a, what is this used for? Barbecues, right? I think, usually, right? So um, there's a spark here, and you don't have to see it because we can. So I've got gas coming out of here. So that shows you that there was, you know, we use the spark to ignite to ignite the flame. So that's what's going on in a, <coughs> with a, an oven with a, a stove with a piezoelectric uh, lighter igniter. Uh, there's a magnetic counterpart to this. I don't. It's pretty obvious. I don't think. We, I think we can save some time. Um, it's the same idea. Uh, for sonar, the first case is much more important, but we will talk about the magnetic case. There are some magnetic-based sonar devices out there. Okay, anybody have any uh, questions about that? So, what we... God, it stinks. Make sure this is off. <laughs> so, what we want to do now... is talk about... a. a Equivalent electrical circuits. Now you had some of this in 3119, is that correct? All right. You just touched on it just to get the idea in your head. In, in transduction, it's extremely important. All transducer people are very familiar with equivalent electric circuits. And the reason is, the reason is this. Unless you're dealing with a very simple system, it's much easier to solve Kirchhoff's laws than Newton's laws. It's much easier to solve some um, electrical oscillatory circuit than some mechanical oscillatory system. And we will see examples of this. I, I'll make, I'm, I always make sure, it, it's, I think it's an important thing for you to see, the advantage. And the reason it's important is, you know, it takes effort to come up with an equivalent electrical circuit. And so that's, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about this now in this introductory chapter. And then we're going to use equivalent electrical circuits for just about the whole course. Um, so the idea is that instead of solving some mechanical system, you s solve the equivalent electrical system. To do that, you need a correspondence between the variables. Believe it or not, there are actually two correspondences or, or analogies. There's not just one. The one that you're familiar with is called the impedance analogy. And there, which is very natural, and a lot of people think, oh, there's no, that's it. Well, it's, it's not true, as we will uh, um, see tomorrow. Today, we'll just focus on the impedance analogy. 
The other one's called the mobility analogy. <coughs> So we think of, mechanically, we think of the force as the drive and the velocity as the response, right? Electrically, we think of the voltage as the drive, and what does it drive? It drives current. So it's natural to, to state that the force corresponds to the voltage. It's actually not necessary, as we will see tomorrow. But this is the standard analogy. Um, so the response here, mechanically is the velocity, it corresponds to the current. Uh, everything or nearly everything that we're going to do in this course is going to be steady state motion. Everything's going to have an, all the variables are going to have an e to the i omega t dependence. So we can immediately replace a derivative here, just put in an i omega, right? And an integral for the displacement would divide by i omega. Um, so the displacement will correspond to the charge. You may remember, and we'll actually prove it in a moment, the mass corresponds to the inductance. Okay. Uh, the resistances correspond. Now we put an M here to denote the fact that this is mechanical, not electrical. You have to be careful with that. These don't have the same units, right? These don't have the same units. They just correspond. And now, this will cause a little bit of trouble with you in the beginning. <coughs> But the capacitance here, as, we, as I'll show you, corresponds to the, res, the inverse stiffness here. So this S is what appears in uh, Hooke's law. We don't, in mechanics, you usually use K. We don't use K here because K is reserved for the wave number in waves. So we're, that's why KFCS, and that's why we're using um, S as the stiffness here. It's the spring constant. And what the capacitance corresponds to is the inverse spring constant and, or stiffness. And this is so important that it has a name, it's called the compliance. And even though it's a simple mathematical relationship here, conceptually it causes some trouble in the beginning. And for transducers, compliance is more important than stiffness, as you'll see. So you want to get used to thinking of the compliance of a spring. And to see that, that the correspond, put a little put this in here, you can easily see uh, Q, for a capacitor we have Q is equal to CV, right? So V is 1 over C times Q. This is analogous to Hooke's law, which I just wrote there, F is equal to SX. So we see that what's analogous here, we can see that the capacitance is corresponds to the compliance, not the stiffness. It's so 1 over the stiffness. <coughs> uh, all the variables are, we're not going to do boldface. It's just understood that all the variables are in general complex, right? Uh, okay, so let's look at the most important. This is probably, probably the first thing you did in 3119. That was a while ago. Um, <coughs> here's the standard case of a driven, damped, simple harmonic oscillator. These are rigid, massless wires here, right? I'm exerting some oscillatory force. I got some inertia, some stiffness, and some damping. And this is moving at some instantaneous velocity u, which the mass will be moving at the same velocity. Let me, for right now, let me just write down what the equivalent circuit is and we will mathematically verify it. And then we'll go back and I'll explain to you how you go from here to here. That's what we have to do. We'll need to, usually this is how it's done, you begin with some mechanical circuit and you want to come up with the electrical circuit which you can solve. And then once you've solved in terms of these parameters, you just go in and substitute, everywhere you see an L, you substitute an M, and etc. Now you've solved the mechanical problem. That's basically the idea. <coughs> so, <coughs> For right now, just assuming this is the equivalent electrical circuit, we can write down Newton's second law for, um, for this mass here. Okay, the mass times the acceleration is the sum of all the forces on the mass. Now, I wrote it like this just for to make it symmetrical. You can imagine, it, maybe it's better, you can imagine moving this mass along here and putting it well, right here, if you like. Maybe that looks better, right? It, you're not changing anything. I just did it like this just for symmetry. So you can, it's not going to change anything. The mass can be here. We see that there are 
three forces on the mass. There's this external force. There is a damping force here. Now, because we've, you know, for positive velocity, the, the force is going to, force is always, the damping force opposes the velocity. So we've got to put a minus sign here. You've got to be careful with that. So there's the damping force. And then there's the spring force uh, from Hooke's law. And again, we're not using S, we're using 1 over the compliance. And if I move this way, this, if compared, if this is equilibrium, and I move this way, the spring is, because there's a, you know, opposite direction. So we need a sign, a sign change there. We can then put this equation in standard form for different, for different, and we get a differential equation for U. Which if we want to, we can then solve. And yeah, that was, you know, you beat that to death in 3119. So we get this equation for the velocity. What about the circuit here? How do we handle this? We just use Kirchhoff's loop rule. So already you can see, I think that it's, well, at this point, it's about the same effort. You sum the voltage all around, all around the loop, you have to get zero. So here we, um, for positive V, we step up in voltage. And unfortunately, this is on the next page. So I'm going to have a V. When I go this way, in the direction of the arrow, there's going to be, by Faraday induction, there's going to be a back EMF in the opposite direction that I'm changing the current. So this is the positive direction of the current. If I'm changing, increasing the current in that direction, I get a voltage in the back. And you remember what that voltage is? It's proportional to the rate of change of the current. It's the inductance times the rate of change of the current. Okay, so that's elementary e and m electromagnetism. Uh, the capacitor, it's a reduction. This is, this is the positive plate, this is the negative plate. We're stepping down in voltage. Q is equal to CV. So it's C over Q. So, uh, excuse me, Q, um, Q is equal to CV. So the, volt, uh, the voltage, right, okay. So you can put this in the standard form. And now if you compare this equation to the mechanical equation and use the correspondence in that table, you'll see that they're ident mathematically identical. To a mathematician, there's no difference between the two. L is, L is analogous to M, and the resistances, you'll see they're the same. Now, now there's another. So that's good, OK. But how do, we con how do we know to go from here? How do we construct this? How do we go from here to here? Well, let me tell you, there's no clear-cut way to do this. As far as I know, no one's come up with some kind of algorithm to do this. And I've often thought that it would be a great thing to, to, uh, to, as a developing ground for artificial intelligence. Because as some of you, may, I don't know how deeply you got into this in 3119, but this can be challenging coming up on an electrical equivalent circuit, okay? Um, so what most people do is, I've, I've seen transdu, I know a number of transducer experts, okay, I don't know, I might have told you that yesterday, I can't remember. Um, but they'll often just start, they'll just draw an equivalent circuit. And then you think, well, how do they do that so quickly? Well, they're actually just guessing. Okay, they have so much experience that they can make a pretty good educated guess. And then they go in and they just check it. You can check certain limiting cases. You can set um, a mass equal to zero. You can set a stiffness equal to infinity. You can set a mass equal to infinity. You can go to these extreme cases. So we're going to be doing that in here. We'll be, and we do some examples of that. We'll probably, uh, maybe in the problem set this, this week. I don't know. I can't remember. Um, so, the best thing to do, the first thing you want to do is you want to look at your mechanical system. You want to look at the number of velocities, the different velocities that you have. Each one of those velocities is going to correspond to a current, right? So, how many velocities do we have here? Well, the mass has some velocity. What about the spring? Well. There is a velocity here, the spring, and it depends upon, actually depends upon the difference of the two velocities here, but this is fixed. So we look at this velocity right here. It's the same as the velocity here. What about this? It's like the spring. How many velocities do we have? One. What does our electrical circuit have to be? It has to be a single loop. There's, actually, there's no choice. So in this case, we're done. And it doesn't matter the order here, just like it doesn't matter. You can interchange elements. We have that here. We're done. 
So it's easy. That case is easy. It has to be. Now, if you want to look for trouble, you can also go through, um, I think I wrote this in here. I'm going to skip it. Uh, oh, this is really alternatively. You can look at the forces in there. So, but we, I think that's, that's good enough for right now. You can look at this if you're interested. We'll eventually probably do that in, some, in a homework or something. Um, now, now I want to introduce something to you that's not in the book, and I can't remember where I picked it up from, either somebody's lecture notes or another book. It has, it has a little bit of, of usefulness, okay, um, here. It's not a real big deal, but I think it is, it's worthwhile introducing. We can classify variables, mechanical and electrical variables, as either a, each variable is either a through variable or an across variable. Okay, it's kind of weird, that's the words they use. And here's the idea. In an electrical circuit, if I've got an element, and I'm, I want to associate a voltage with that, what do I mean? I mean it's the potential difference across here. So that's an across variable. So it depends upon the difference in the voltage, if you like, the, the voltage across there. It's an across variable. A uh, current, what do you think current is? It's through variable, right? Okay. Now, what about mechanics? Well, it's a little bit more difficult. What's really, what's relevant, as we just saw, is the velocity. For a spring, what's important is the difference in the two velocities. If the velocity on either end of the spring, if they're both the same, the spring's not doing anything, right? So, so, um, So the um, so velocity is really an across variable mechanically. That's a little hard to swallow, but if you think about like I said, if you think about this, it's it's really it depends upon the difference there of the motions. So it's an across variable. Um, and this is also hard to swallow. This spring and this dash pot are massless. When we draw a diagram like that, we assume these are, if they do, if we want to include the fact that there can be some mass here, we lump it into here. Okay, so these are ideal. Because they're massless, there can be no net force on it. So the, they actually transmit the force. There can't be a change in force as you go there. It has to have equal and opposite forces. So force is a through variable, all right? Yeah, I know, it's, not, it's, it's a stretch. So here's the, here's the big deal. Our standard analogy is mixed. Look at this. Force corresponds to voltage, right? This is a through variable. This is an across variable. And that is why this kind of thing happens here. We have a parallel circuit here corresponding to a series circuit here. It's because we're mixing the across and the through. The, the other analogy doesn't mix them. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay. Oh, that's right. You guys just, you don't leave, do you? Yeah, that's weird. Seems weird to me. <laughs>